It is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar from input to output, making the New York State World Language Standards work for you. Now I will leave you with our amazing presenter, one of Clad World Languages Sales Consultant, uh, Christy O'Connor. Christy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you everyone for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, just to give you a little bit of background information about myself, your presenter tonight, uh, like Sabrina said, my name is Christy, Christy O'Connor. Um, I am a Connecticut native. Um, I still reside in Connecticut now. And I'm also a former Spanish teacher. I taught high school Spanish for around seven years. And I left the classroom in 2021. So it's really great to be here with all of you, with fellow educators. I love spending time with teachers just because they are truly my people. Um, I received a bachelor's degree in Spanish with a minor in psychology from Western Connecticut State University, and then my master's in secondary education from Sacred Heart University. I'm very passionate about professional learning, professional development, and curriculum writing, so I love that I get to continue that passion by sharing information here with teachers and also in my job every day at Cloud World Languages. So as a teacher, I am not phased by interruptions. I know Sabrina said to use the chat and, uh, sparingly. I will ask you to use the chat a couple of times. So when I do, feel free to chime in. I love to hear what your thoughts are and to get some opinions. And um, let's get started. So what are we going to be learning about and uh, seeing today? So the first is we're going to go over a couple of definitions, um, just making sure that we're all on the same page with what we are going to be talking about in regards to some specific terms. We're going to be going over what are the state standards that I'm specifically going to be referencing in this presentation. And then we're going to go into the three modes because that's really going to be our focus and how to move from input to output. And then at the end, um, we will do our Q&A session with some feedback and see how can we use what we're talking about today in the future in our classrooms, hopefully maybe even tomorrow. So first, how can we understand the topics that we're going over today and making sure we're all on the same page in regards to our definitions? So the three definitions I just wanna quickly review with you all are input, output, and communication. Um, so remembering that input is the language that learners hear, read, or see, and attend uh, to for meaning within a communicative event. Output is producing the target language in order to express meaning, and communication is the expression, interpretation, and sometimes negotiation of meaning in a given context. And what is more, communication is also purposeful. Um, this is really what I want to focus on is what does this mean? And to remember as well that communication does not equal speaking. Of course, it can equal speaking, but a lot of people, I think, often make the two terms synonymous, and it doesn't always pan out that way. As it says in the definition we just looked at, it has expression, interpretation, negotiation, so much more. So we need to keep that in mind as we are moving forward. And then what are going to be the New York State standards we're going to be trying to harness today and keeping in mind as we're going from this input to output process? So um, I just want to say before I get into these standards that I know it can be challenging moving into a new standard set. It's challenging to have any sort of change, but to remember that you are not alone in these changes. Um, I, as I said a moment ago, am from Connecticut. I am not a New York teacher. So by no means am I an expert in these things. I am an expert in our materials. For example, what we'll be referencing a lot today, reporteros. And hopefully I can find some ways to connect those two to you to help you get ideas for your own classroom. But remember, if you really want to do the work to learn a bit more about the New York State Standards, there are so there's so much information on the state website. I personally use so much of it to help support my presentation today. Um, there are fantastic webinars that are really going to give you a great idea as to go into a lot of what we're talking about today and to get even more ideas of how to apply it into your classroom. So please remember to seek those out um, and to use them to the best of your ability. So looking at the five uh, learning standards that we're going to be uh, you know, focusing on, we're really going to be drawing in on these three standards here that are, as we can see, the three modes of communication. So these are going to really help support us to, again, go through that input to output um, process and with an objective of proficiency. 
And I just really love this um, graphic that I got from the state website, which does a really great job, I think, of showing and modeling what are the different pieces of the standards that we're going to be looking at. And again, focusing on the ones that are on the left hand side with the three modes of communication with that our um, overarching um, communication standard being our main goal. I really particularly like this because I think it's a really great way to look at um, you know, the different verbiage that you can use to help support your kid do statements, and also what do these things look like um, in our classrooms. So the first thing I think is always good to reflect on is, is what are these changes about? Why are we making them? And what are we leaving behind most importantly? Um, so first, to remember the PPP method to really be put in the past, which is, uh, if you're not familiar, presentation, practice, production. Many of us are probably familiar with it, even if we're not familiar with the name, because it's how a lot of us learned the language, our second language, or we're taught on how to teach a second language. For myself, that holds true. That was how I was taught Spanish in high school, and it is also how I was taught to teach high school Spanish. Um, so doing that direct instruction, our students doing some rote practice, um, and then having them do production in fixed scenarios. So while this method can be really comfortable for us because it often makes sense to us, you know, it goes from that kind of larger to smaller funnel process. It's easy to break down. It follows the like, I do, you do, we do model. Um, and it's also easier for us to grade. However, we should know that now our evidence is really showing that this is not going to help our students to be able to uh, foster that communication and that we really want to make sure that we're focusing on what is proven to be helpful language acquisition tools. Language accuracy assessments, um, you know, like a fill in the chart for grammar, um, conjugations or, you know, matching vocabulary to their translations. While there is a time and a place for these, they should not be our summative assessment or goal. They should not be our end all purpose or what we're trying to achieve. Um, so just keeping that in mind as well. Um, material that is not comprehensible input. Um, we remember that Krashen asserts that we should be using the I plus one model, which is our input, and then plus one being a little bit beyond what their actual level is. Um, because remember, we want to be challenging them in that vertical, vertical growth. If we're only doing things that I, we're not doing that plus one, we are not doing things in a way that we're challenging them to grow. They're staying in their comfort zone. And for us to be growing and learning, we should be pushing ourselves a little bit out of our bounds um, and making sure that our material is truly comprehensible input. Um, if we think about it, you know, if you were to take a student and sit them in front of a TV show and they're watching it all in Spanish, that is input. Are they going to then just know how to speak Spanish because they've watched that? No, it's because it's not comprehensible. So we need to learn how to do that. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in detail as well. Push production. If we only focus on the output and not focusing on creating the systems necessary in order to foster that production, we're gonna lead our students into a situation where they're probably gonna feel frustrated or insecure or unmotivated to continue. So we wanna make sure that we're when we're getting to that production phase, we're also you know, facilitating the construction of what they need to actually produce appropriately. Communication without purpose. This is probably going to be something you hear me say the most in this presentation, just really focusing always that our goal should always be some sort of purpose that goes beyond the classroom. Our communicative purpose should always be what our, you know, focus is and our base and foundation is for what we're doing in our activities. And then lack with lack of equity. Um, I think it's important to remember that in a lot of these kind of antiquated practices, there is a lack of equity in the learning process. For example, if you think about language uh, accuracy assessments, um, for a lot of our heritage speakers, that could be potentially an inequitable assessment of their abilities. This was something I struggled with in my classroom. I had, you know, a vocab list and I vocab quiz. My students were supposed to fill in the blank and they provided a vocab term that was correct but it wasn't the one I was looking for. So is that right or is that wrong? You know, or even for me, I had rubrics that were looking for a specific production of a specific grammar topic, you know, give me a list of recommendations using the present subjunctive. And then my student used um, an impersonal expression precedent infinitive. Was it comprehensive? Could I understand them? Was their communicative purpose fulfilled? Yes, but was it what I asked for? No, and unfortunately, that ended up taking them down on my rubrics. And it was always very frustrating for me because it was like, 
yes, you did it right, but you didn't do it the right, right way. So remembering that that can be a really inequitable practice. And we want to make sure that our classrooms are equitable for all of our students and all having a great opportunity to show and demonstrate proficiency in the language. So that being said, let's jump right into our three modes and see how we can weave and navigate through that input to output process in our three modes of communication. So starting off with the interpretive mode and talking about comprehensible input. So again, I always want to remember as well that when we are starting with these things, we should always be referencing back to what are going to be the things that are going to support us to do this successfully. And one of the greatest things that we can do with this specifically, particularly when we're talking about the three modes, is to focus on the performance indicators and the range of proficiency that's going to correspond to the different checkpoint ranges and is also going to correspond to the different modes that we're talking about. Of course, we have the ones from the state and then we also have really great ones from Actful that are going to help us to break down and see what are reasonable expectations for ourselves as educators and also for our students. It can be hard sometimes to gauge our, ourselves back and say, you know, it's of course we want our students to be talking and chit chatting and going back and forth. But we also need to make sure that we're building them up to those points and that we're assessing them appropriately on the, those checkpoints up to make sure they feel successful enough to continue on and scaffold up and get to those really great things that we want them to do, like full conversations, you know, full opportunities to express their different things. So I did just want to share this as well. I took one of the unit template um templates uh, from the New York website. I filled it out kind of to give a reference of what this would look like for me if I were to fill this out for the topic we're going to be going over. So the references that you're going to see in the different modes are all going to kind of reference back to this unit that we were doing. So I pulled this from level one of Reporteros and it is from um, chapter three, which is Hogar Dulce Hogar, Home Sweet Home. And so this is going to be focusing on the novice range. So when you see me pulling from the different performance indicators and also the different um, strands of what we should be expecting from our students, those realistic expectations, I'm gonna be focusing in the novice range since this is a level one material. And also what we're gonna be hearing and seeing is gonna be revolving around household vocabulary, um, students being able to identify pieces of the home, family members, um, talking about shared responsibility of chores and labor and things like that. Um, so you'll see that as we're going through the different references, as I'm pulling through some lesson ideas of how you can connect these different activities. So why is the interpretive mode so important? First off, I would argue it's one of the most, probably the most important of the three modes that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and the reason why it's so important and so fundamental is because it's where we derive the majority of our comprehensible input and is our primary source of acquisition, you know, where we talked about building and creating those systems, that's all done through that input process. Um, and it really does the heavy lifting of you know creating our understanding of the language so that way we can navigate to that output process. Um, it can be challenging to navigate because there uh, one large factor is as you can see here is going to be the implicit understanding portion. So what does that mean? Is that we often don't know what we don't know. And it's also we often don't know what we do know. So there's so many things that we have created these systems and faculties that are already in our minds and it's often hard to kind of articulate and break down why exactly certain things function different ways. To give you an example, if someone came up to me as a native English speaker and said, hey, Christy, why is it I taught and not I teached? I could give you that answer now because I have a lot of experience in grammar explanation as a former Spanish teacher. But before I was a teacher, I think it would have been really hard for me to articulate why why one of those is right and why one of them is wrong. Often we'll just end up saying, I don't know, I just know that one's right. And so that happens to all of us. There's a lot of these systems that are in place that we're not always aware of. And that's a good thing because we can build off of them. And it's also something that's important to remember that that's how we learn languages naturally. It's what our brain is hardwired to do. So you don't always have to break down every single thing thing in order for it to be understood and to be used appropriately. Um, input is also where we're going to be finding a lot of our purpose, okay? We talked about how we need to make sure we have a communicative purpose, we need to have meaningful communication. So 
what is that going to look like? What, what, how does that factor into the interpretive mode? So we're really using our interpretive mode as a great way for we uh, for us as teachers to contextualize the material and also kind of demonstrate what is going to be the purpose of our output. You know, why are we setting up this system? What is our goal going to be beyond just understanding? It's also a really great mode because it's usually more low risk. Of course, we know for students, if they're producing and they're at that output phase, that can be a really uh, anxious, you know, anxiety inducing opportunity for them because, of course, we don't want to make step mistakes. So when we're in the input mode, um, that is a, usually where our students can feel a little bit more uh, comfortable because they're building their confidence, they're building those systems, they're, you know, they're a little bit more in the listening stage of things. But I think it's important to remember that there is more to input than just listening. Um, and we want to make sure that we're remembering that input should not be a passive experience, okay? We should not be having input be just that we are talking at our students. It's just that direct instruction, that first P of the PPP mode, the presentation. If you are simply giving the information and you are not making sure that there is negotiation for meaning, there's not interpretation of that input, then you're not doing your job. We're not making sure it's truly comprehensible input. So it's important that we do that and that we have these checks in place to make sure our input is comprehensible. So how can we do that? There's a really great list we can see here that are gonna give us a variety of different ways to do this. And I'm sure many of, this do, of us do this all the time. For example, body language and gestures. I don't know a single language teacher that is not an expert at miming because we are always doing that, you know, like beber and, you know, comer and tijeras, you know, we are all experts at doing those things. And those are great examples of how we can make sure that it's being comprehensible. You also want to make sure that you are um, giving opportunities for students to show and demonstrate that they're getting that input and they are interpreting. And it can be simple. It doesn't have to be an output process. It could be just a simple yes or no. It could be simple just mimicking the opportunities that you're giving, the language, giving examples. So there's so many things that you can do to provide that and make sure that it truly is a comprehensible input experience. So what does input look like in the interpretive mode? Again, we want to reference back to our uh, performance indicators and the standards to make sure that we are in the right range. Again, I said I was going to be focusing on the novice range. So we can see that there's a variety of different things that can be in the novice mode that are, or excuse me, novice range for this mode that are going to really help us to make sure that our students are understanding the input process. Um, so we can identify things, basic fact, memorize phrases or words, and very, very visual information. And ideally, of course, we are trying to make sure we're always starting with authentic documents when it comes to our input process. That's going to be the greatest thing. Authentic documents, as I know, can be kind of intimidating, especially when you are working with that novice level, because it's challenging to find an authentic document, something that was created by native speakers for native speakers, that is at the appropriate level, particularly novice, but is still appropriate for your students, because we know we should not be modifying the document, we should be modifying the task. So what can we utilize that's an authentic document that can help support us and make sure that we are in this mode and we're in the range that we're talking about? This authentic document is a great one. It's an infographic. You know, it's a really highly visual image. It has not a ton of text on it, but it still is a great springboard for us to start that input process. You know, it has cognates like responsibility and family. You could use, again, like we talked about before, different gestures. You can say, Toda la familia, you can point to the examples that are in there and lavar los platos and you can indicate and start that input and understanding for meaning best based off of just an image like this with very little text. So again, we really want to make sure that we are using authentic documents and we're using a lot of these skills and different activities to help again make sure it is comprehensible input. These are another great um, examples of authentic documents that you could use as a springboard for that input process, that interpretive mode. Um, again, this these are just images. There are, are no words that are supplied in this one, but it's a wonderful authentic document. These are two works from Carmen Lo, uh, Lomas Garza, um, who is a really wonderful Chicano artist. And you can see via our can-do statement here, 
that we are talking about identifying customs and traditions in a Chicano home. So this can-do statement, the objective of the purpose is focused more on the cultural input. So you as the teacher, when you're doing a focus like this on more of a cultural input, you can use prior you know, systems and knowledge, vocabulary and grammar that has already been set up to help facilitate and do that input process here. So of course, we always wanna make sure we're setting the tone, we're getting information and understanding about what's going on in the background here. So for example, we can see there's a small reading blurb where the students are gonna learn a little bit more about the artists themselves. And we're learning a little bit about why these paintings are being put forward to us and why we're looking at them in the first place. So as I said, input is not a passive activity. We want to have interaction. So I'd love to get some interaction with you guys right now. So given that, again, we talked about this unit being called home sweet home and knowing that we have some background information, our vocabulary is focused on parts of the home, family members and shared responsibility of labor and chores. Um, what are maybe some activities that you could potentially see being utilized with these two authentic resources? So go ahead and use the chat. And if you want to come up with, write any ideas of ones that you think would be interesting that you could see yourself doing in the classroom to, you know, use as a springboard off of these two authentic resources. Are there any ideas of what you would want to do as a pre or a during or a post activity or anything like that? I know that audience participation is not always the most fun thing, so I also have ideas, so don't worry if you don't have any. <laughs> so one great example could be, you know, if we want to talk about using the most out of our authentic documents, and that's so and so important, um, we want to make the, maximize the usage of them. So we should really have some really great pre, during, and post activities to kind of sort out. And we can do that with these, again, even though that they have no, um, they don't have any uh, wording on them. Oh, these are some great, some people are spreading some ideas. I was a little worried that I was gonna be only on <laughs> ideas. Uh, working in groups to create your ideal fiesta, connecting um, students to the images. Oh, I love that people are already using these, using AI to create images for you. Yeah, these, and that's a great opportunity as well. Comparing contrasting um, celebrations and traditions. That was actually one of the activities I had. So a great pre-activity you could do for these paintings, you know, looking at them and saying, all right, let's go around and we could identify parts of the home. You know, la familia está en la habitación. La familia está en la cocina. You know, using it to talk about and describing the image, exactly. Um, we can use it to uh, identify objects with numbers, okay? Talking about pieces of the home for our furniture, like hay una cama, hay tres ventanas, hay um, una silla, many things like that. You could use them to talk about um, and guess family members or people vocabulary. Uh, hay una mujer, hay una muchacha, hay un gato. Or you could guess about who family members are. That's actually, I used to use the painting on the right, La Tabalada, and I use that to do family vocabulary. So my students would guess and say, mm, creo que es la abuela, or creo que es el tío, pieces like that. And then we would also use it to use circumlocution to connect each other. You know, el tío es el hermano de la madre, and they would connect the different people and guess who they thought they were. Um, Exactly. Using, uh, identifying activities that are happening in here. What is the grandmother doing? What do you think the daughter is doing? What are these people doing? Making guesses about what's happening. All of those are really great things. Um, inter, you know, dur during activities, doing an interpersonal experience, I mean, excuse me, an interpersonal speaking, you know, describing how is the grandmother? What color are her clothes? Uh, what are these people doing? How old do you think that person is? Um, that would be a great opportunity. Uh, you could do similar activities for both of these images, actually. Talking about shared responsibility, using this as a springboard to get into the topic and conversation of what's coming ahead. You know, is there shared responsibility in this home? How do you know that? What does shared responsibility look like? Um, and even exactly as someone talked about before, using this to compare and contrast, contrast different relationships here. You know, um, compare, compare and contrast the family members that are present. You know, when do you have family members living with you that are in your extended family or not? 
Do you have a certain event or food that is tied to a tradition or custom that is really important to you? For example, I would talk about tamaladas are very commonly associated with, you know, Christmas. And so making those tamales together, that's a really great familial experience. So do you have anything like that? Do you have, you know, myself, I have Irish descent, corned beef and cabbage for St. Patrick's Day is coming up. Students uh, making Christmas cookies with their families before Christmas, um, things like that. That's a great opportunity. And I think it's important to remember that, yes, our students may be novice in their ability for the language, but many times, especially with, with our, you know, novice speakers, a lot of times they are novice like middle school, high school, and middle school and high school students may be novice in their production and their understanding of the target language, but they are not novice thinkers. So we can still ask them to do these, you know, deeper contrast contrast activities, even though they may not necessarily have the language to express it yet. But this could still be a great opportunity for a springboard, and we can provide them scaffolded supports to be able to express those sentiments, um, you know, with word banks on the wall, on the wall, or um, or on the board, modeling sentence starters, all things like that. Um, I also really love to always in include something that's like a little bit fun, especially either as like a warm up or an exit ticket. So like for me, when I did the painting of the tamalada, I would always show this video, which was talking about tamales. And um, I love it because it's super fun. I'm not going to play the audio because you won't be able to hear me. And um, it is a little bit crazy, this like little song. But you could use this as an opportunity to connect two things. Because remember, a huge thing we we're going to talk about today as well is that the different modes and those different standards should not be isolated experiences, nor should our different opportunities for talking about things. You know, this is not necessarily an opportunity, I mean, a, a unit about food, but we're using an opportunity here with this authentic image talks about tamales. You could talk about tamales with your students. What are they? Have they had them before? What were they like? And then they could watch this fun little video and connect food vocabulary with it, have them identify a couple of terms they saw for food vocabulary, um, or even you could springboard this to a grammar connection, you know, you see here they're saying tamaritos, calientitos, un besito, what, what is this ito that you see appearing, appearing here, make a guess, what do you think is going on, um, so there's a lot of opportunities for you to connect to other topics, to connect to other modes, and I think that's a really important thing to remember, that there's lots of opportunities for us to weave in and out. Just because you have a certain focus, it doesn't mean that it should be your only focus um, for what you're talking about. And it's not something you should stay in this isolated little box. Interpersonal communication, creating meaningful interpersonal um, interactions. So why is the interpersonal mode so challenging? I think we all know it is. It definitely can be in the classroom. Um, and there's a couple of different reasons I think that kind of pinpoint why it can be so challenging. So the first is just because it is so intellectually taxing for our students. If you think about, for example, an interpersonal conversation, you know, our students should be uh, interpreting the information that they're hearing from their partner. They are negotiating for meaning, and then they are also expected to produce a response. So that's a lot going on all at the same time. I'm sure many of us relate to that from when maybe we were learning our second language of what that experience was like. Um, and so that can be really hard for our students to kind of go through, especially at the novice level. Um, so it can be really hard to find time to do that when we know it can be such a challenge for our students. Spontaneous. Remember, our interpersonal mode should be a spontaneous creation. Um, of course, there's preparation involved in anything we do in the language classroom, you know, because we're, we're preparing by creating our structures that we talked about, our vocabulary, our grammar. Um, but by for our interpersonal mode, ideally, it should be a spontaneous conversation. We're saying, you know, let's talk about this topic here. You don't have a script in front of you. It's not like the presentational mode where you usually have a little bit more structure and practice beforehand. It should be simulating a spontaneous interpersonal conversation that's going to facilitate a more proficient speaker. So that leaves a lot more room for error for our students, which, of course, they know if they can't rehearse and practice and perfect it beforehand, they're going to be a little bit more nervous about that. 
And then also the correction itself. We know they're probably going to be making some errors. And we know, of course, in the classroom, we want to be correcting those errors. But when we're doing the interpersonal um, conversations or interpersonal mode, I'm sure many of us know it's very challenging to uh, provide correction to our students. When we have two students who are paired up, they're doing a speaking. They might be making mistakes and the other one is copying them. They usually don't have the opportunity or the ability to correct someone, to know, notice a mistake and be able to correctly correct them. Um, or even for us as the teacher, if we want to do it, that is an incredibly time consuming task. I mean, I had typically around 25 to 30 students in a classroom. If I'm doing a paired speaking for one minute, only one minute of speaking for my students in a paired speaking, that's 15 minutes just of the speaking. That does not include any time to set up the activity, to explain who their partner is, what we're talking about, how long it's gonna be, getting them set up, and then also does not include any of the time for providing that feedback or you know gathering that feedback. Maybe you're just gonna write it down and send it to them. Still, that takes a lot of time. And so for us to delegate that time in the classroom can sometimes be taxing for us. So it can be a very challenging mode. So what can we do to kind of navigate that? So again, Always we should be referencing back what are the standards that we're going to be doing? What are the indicators? What is reasonable for our students within the different range of proficiency that they're in and what we should be asking of them? And again, also, what is the purpose of why we are doing this? Not a purpose of, oh, I just want we're practicing the preterite or, oh, a purpose of we want to practice how to speak. Remember, our communicative purpose should be what is the goal in regards to proficiency for communication of how it applies beyond the classroom, you know? How can they take this and use it and come back to you and say, oh, I'm so excited. I went to this place and I did this and it was so cool because we did it in class and then I knew what I was doing. We love those moments as teachers. And if we are making sure our focus is the communicative purpose, we're gonna get a lot more of those moments because they're gonna have the opportunity to see the application and that's gonna get better buy-in for your students because they're gonna see that it's a realistic understanding and a realistic practice of the language. And it's also going to get rid of those questions of why do I need to learn this or when are we ever going to use this because it answers itself. So this is a great example of an interpersonal, again, an authentic document we can use as a springboard in order for us to have some interpersonal interactions. Um, this is particularly a one of our reports from our reporteros in the series, and they're talking about different rooms throughout the world. I love this particular report just because I think it's so interesting. I love that it has bedrooms from multiple places, not just Spanish speaking places. Um, and I love the opportunity it gives our students to have a more, more global perspective and also have some really cool interactions in regard to the document and each other. So, you know, what could we do for prompting conversations about this? We could ask them, what do these students have in, in common with each other? What do we see connecting throughout the different rooms? Um, using their vocabulary to describe the different things that they see, similar to what we did with the other paintings. You know, what is the furniture you see? What are the items that you're noticing? Guessing, how old do you think that these students are? Why do you think that? Um, how do you think this person is? What do you think their personality is like? What do you think their hobbies are, their likes and their dislikes? What do you see that's giving you that thought? Um, how does this compare to your room? You know, do you see that you have anything in common with these students doing a really great cultural comparison? And these could be great opportunities for think pair shares. You could have students do an, a pair discussion where they're looking and they're talking and they're brainstorming together. There's a lot of different ways you could do that. A great opportunity and thinking back to the slide we just saw where we were looking at the different checkpoints and the different um, indicators we can see for success. A great one for interpersonal mode is doing different types of surveys. So we could have our students create a survey about bedrooms in the classroom. We could have a survey that says, you know, is your room shared or do you live have your own bedroom or what floor of the house is your room on? Are you on the main floor? Do you live in a basement? Do you have a second floor? Um, what's the color of your bedroom walls? What kind of decor do you have? Do you have books, posters, art, et cetera? And then they could create that, um, that survey themselves. They could have an interpersonal conversation by going around the room and interviewing their peers. And then they could do a presentational speaking where they are sharing out what they learned and comparing it with the class results. Um, these is one, again, all of these are activities off of these simple authentic documents 
that give us so much without having to go beyond the range that's very far from our students um, and just having a lot of different ways. And again, weaving in and out of the different modes and in and out of different topics. We should not be locking ourselves in these boxes because that's really not an organic learning process. There's, I used to say to my students, they'd be like, well, I want to use my notes. And I'm like, well, of course you do, but you know, there's never a situation where you're going to walk up to someone and like be in Spain and go into a train station and say, excuse me, I'd like to have a conversation, but only with this vocabulary. I only know how to use this and only in the present tense, please. You know, that's not realistic. So we want to make sure that we are giving them realistic opportunities to weave in and out because that is what language learning looks like in a normal process. Um, so what are some help, helpful tools we can use for interpersonal speakings? Again, I know interpersonal does not only refer to speakings, but I'm sure that's probably the one we probably have the biggest challenge with. So what can we do to make it a little bit easier? So first, making it as relatable as possible. We all know that if students already don't connect to the topic, to get them to elaborate on something they don't feel like they have an understanding or connection with is going to make it that much harder. For example, I previously used a textbook that um, had this whole chapter on camping. I am not a camping gal. Um, I, I like it, but is it something I want to do every weekend? Is it part of my actual conversational Spanish? No, I actually had to learn a lot of that vocabulary when I started teaching because I had to know it to teach it to my students. And after all of my time learning the Spanish language, it had never naturally become part of my language acquisition process because I'm not a camper. It's not part of my conversational language. So if someone were to ask me to talk about camping, I would struggle just because that's that's not something it's an interesting, relatable topic to me. And the same thing goes for our students. You know, if we're, we're making it that much harder for them to talk, if it's something that they can't connect to and they don't have a lot of thoughts and, and ideas about in their own language, never mind the target language. Making it as low stakes as possible, okay? We know that this is challenging, it's scary, students don't wanna make mistakes. So uh, one great thing we can do about this is making speaking in the classroom something we do as often as possible. Make it a standard in the classroom. But when they come in, they knew they're doing some sort of speaking activity. So when you say we're doing a speaking, it's not like, oh my God, a speaking day. Like, no, every day is a speaking day. We are regularly incorporating this into our lessons and using it to practice what we're learning. Um, and I also really encourage rotating partners. I know that we can give them some comfort by having them paired with someone that they know. But ideally, again, what I used to say to my students, you don't always get to have a conversation with someone you know already. If you're in a train station in Spain and you need to get a ticket and you can't figure it out, you don't have a bestie there to consult, you're probably gonna be asking someone you've never met before. And so getting that opportunity to practice with someone you're not the most familiar with can be a really great opportunity um, to kind of simulate that in the classroom, which is really nice. I actually had a peer who used to every single day when her students would come in, there was like one of those big spinny wheels on the board and it had all their names on it and they would spin and that's who they were sitting with that day. So every single day they got new speaking partners Again, and not only is that more organic, but they're also getting more opportunities to grow. If they're talking to the same people all the time, they're not going to get those new opportunities of new ideas or new thoughts or practices together to expand and really grow. So again, that's a great way to do it. And one of the best things that I think that can really help is an end task. And what I mean by that is having them have something that they have to do after the interpersonal speaking to un, um, demonstrate that negotiation and interpretation for meaning. So because for our students, they are often so focus on what they need to say because they want it to be perfect, that they're not getting a two-way experience out of the conversation. They're not listening and reacting. And as we can see, our novice mode reactions are crucial when it comes to interpersonal um, op opportunities. So we want to make sure that they are focusing on that as well. So saying to them, well, after the end of this, you're going to share three things you learned from your partner, or you're going to, we're going to go with through and we're going to compare as a class, the X, Y, Z, or you're going to present your, your thoughts to the class at the end. Um, having that opportunity at the end, something they have to focus on is going to give them the opportunity and force them to have that two-way negotiation for their interpersonal experience. And then lastly, presentational communication, facilitating opportunities for meaningful output. Okay, so we again, we're weaving from input to output, and we want to look at the presentational mode, which we know is primarily focused on output. And I know that the presentational mode can be typically the one that our students dread the most, at least that was my experience. You know, presentations were never a fun experience because 
to them, presentation was a dirty word. And we know that because memes like this exist, you know, where our students are, they hear that they're gifted present in Spanish and they're like, or any target language, and they're like, <gasps> their hearts stop. You could hear a pin drop in the classroom because they are dreading it. They are freaking out. Um, and we want to make sure that we're using opportunities to do this that is not going to have that experience. And we can help make our students feel a bit more comfortable. Again, setting manageable expectations, referring back to the standards, referring back to the indicators of what we can do to make sure our students feel like they can be successful. So a great example here would be, you know, we can see creating a poster or making a short video or writing a list or labeling images. Um, again, it doesn't have to be a full presentation. I made that mistake often when I was a teacher. In the beginning, I would ask my students to do something that I thought was so cool, but it was so beyond their abilities at that time. I had not scaffolded up those necessary faculties to get to that. Um, so using these um, references to help support that can really kind of give us a reality check and make sure that we're scaffolding things to get make them feel successful. So when we're doing a, pro a presentation, there's a lot of different things that we can do, even if it is that full presentation mode. You know, for example, we could see here one of our mini projects we're doing for this unit is our students are going to be presenting what would be their perfect home. So um, how to make this successful? So first, again, making it engaging, okay, making it a real world scenario that is relatable. Um, as we talked about earlier, if they can relate to it, they're going to be able to give more to it and see the applicability beyond the classroom. Um, giving st clear step-by-step -step instructions and organizers are always the key to my heart. I personally am a very visual person, and I know that as a former language learner and knowing my students, they I would go over things with them and then they would forget them. So having the step-by-step -step instructions as a clear reference point to go back to, that if they don't want to ask you, because we know it's intimidating sometimes to ask for extra help, that they can go back to that on their own and say, oh yeah, that's what I'm supposed to do next. And I personally just love organizers so much. I think graphic organizers are such a great resource. Some students really thrive with them and it can really be a great way for you to check in with your students. Um, because as you can see later on, I really suggest doing check-ins at some point before a presentation is given. So you can just make sure how your students are doing. If they have not done those organizers, you can redirect them and say, I know we didn't think we needed this organizer, but I can see that we're struggling to put our ideas together. So by the end of class, I want you to give me this organizer. I want to go over it with you. And then next class, we have a great thing to work off of and springboard to be, may, be more successful. Um, I absolutely think that rubric should re be reviewed as a group at the beginning, saying, this is what I will assess you on. This is what I want the final product to look like. This is what a good final product looks like. So this is what you need to get to here are all the steps to get to that finish line. And then this is how I'm literally going to be grading you. So that's a great way to do that as well. A visual example, look at showing them exactly again what a successful final product looks like. I know that some people can be a little bit hesitant about that because I was as well. I, th I said, if I give them an example, they're just gonna copy it. And there's ways that you can get around that. For example, here, um, our students are designing a perfect home for one of these three scenarios. One of these three families, they need to pick one. So I'm going to show them a model for a family that is not in here. So if they copy it, I'm going to immediately know because it doesn't apply to the needs of what was the task, which is it needs to be a suitable, perfect home for this family's needs. So again, it's not going to meet the expectation, the communicative purpose. Um, and then personal choice, I think, is always a really great way to help support students and make them feel more comfortable in an uncomfortable situation, um, whether that means that they can maybe get a little bit more creative or suit things to their needs and like their own personal style for like your students that may not be particularly artistically inclined. Maybe they could do a digital option where they could design a perfect home out, you know, uh, layout on like Google Slides or something. Or if you have students who really love art, that could be a great opportunity for them to shine and do it on a piece of paper or build a 3D model or you know, having the opportunity to demonstrate your proficiency in a way that's exciting to you while using the target language can be a great way for us to support our students and make them feel a bit more comfortable. And personally, this is something I really believe in, particularly now, is to not assume our students know what we're asking them to do just on the academic level. Um, particularly post-COVID, I was easily able to gauge whether my students had been fully remote or hybrid or in-person just based off of their academic skills in general. And if I'm going to ask my students to create a slideshow and present it in class, they may not have had the opportunity 
to really go through and learn and be taught how to do those things. So I'm going to hopefully have a bank of different things to support them like this that are going to give them the confidence that even if I don't have the time to break that down in class, at least they have it as a reference point that if they're feeling a little bit uncomfortable, they can reference that and check it out and hopefully feel a little bit better while going in. So conclusions. I've talked a lot. We've talked a lot about a different thing. So what are some things that we should make sure are hopefully our takeaways from this? So first, remember, communication does not equal, equal speaking. We want to make sure that there are so many different things that we should be doing when we're communicating with our students or asking our students to communicate. There's negotiation for meaning, there's interpretation, there's input, there's output, there's so much. Um, and we need to remember that as we're doing different things. The interpretive mode is how we begin our acquisition process. And it should not be left for the end of a unit. And what I mean by that, you know, is say, for example, you want to show a really great video. Um, you want to show a really great authentic video. You're doing a unit on quinceanera. So there's a really great video on BBC about quinceanera and it's all in Spanish. And you're like, if I show it now at the beginning of the unit, it's going to go right over my student's head. No, it shouldn't be left for the end after you're like, we've memorized our vocab list, we memorized the grammar, now they can watch it. No, use that as a springboard to give them that vocabulary, to give them that grammar. It should be the, the process that is the start to give us our input. None of the three, standard, um, three standards or the three modes, exactly start with it, um, are a one-time occurrence, nor should they be singular. Um, they should not be something that you say, well, today is a communication or an interpersonal day, or today is an interpretive day, or today is a presentational day. Ideally, all of our activities should be weaving in and out of not just the three modes, but also the input to output process. It should be cyclical. Every time we need new information, which is constant, we're going back to the input. And every time we're going into a opportunity to practice it and demonstrate proficiency, we're doing output. So we should regularly recycling and repeating all of the modes and also the input to output process. And for the last one, I'll tell you a nice little story about my first two years of teaching. So my first year of teaching, I was in my classroom and I was doing a lesson and my door opens and who comes in but my principal. <gasps> Beginning teacher, that is terrifying to get a pop in observation by your principal. So my principal walks in, I'm very nervous. I see them walking around, talking to some of my students and I'm feeling good. I'm like, well, we're doing a great activity. This is a great lesson. I can see the kids are engaged. I'm speaking in Spanish. Like, I think this is going well. And then I saw the post observation notes. So the post observation notes uh, indicated what my principal was talking to them about. So the, they wrote, I went around and asked students, why are you doing this activity? So the first student says, because we're practicing the preterite tense. The second student says, because we have a quiz next week. And the third student said, because she told us to. So I did not do my due diligence in that classroom of making sure that the communicative purpose was not only the foundation, but was crystal clear to my students. Why are we doing this beyond because we have a quiz, beyond because we're doing the preterite, beyond because I told you so, why are you doing this? What can you get out of this? How can this go beyond these four walls and build and help support you to become a great language learner and start really being proficient? I didn't do my job. So hopefully that story will leave that little seed with you. So that way you can remember that should be the basis of everything you do. And again, thank you so much for your time. I really, truly appreciate it. As a former teacher, I know how valuable free time is. So thank you for spending it to me. I hope that you enjoyed this presentation and that it was helpful to you.